So well, we hope you enjoyed that. Um, we are running a little sh um, actually fast on time. So KVMR is going to hear that little commercial, and then I'm supposed to go into my talk. But they're not doing that yet, right, Paul? No, it's not going to happen that way. It's too late. Uh, it's too late. Okay, so just just continue. Well, I wanted to. We're going to start from the KVMR at 6:45. Just talking now, say we're going to start at 6:45. Okay. Okay. So you'll signal me when. Yeah. To start, okay. So I knew I had a little time to fill here, and um, one thing that was interesting in watching that movie was watching Max Baucus. Okay, um, I got an article from a friend of mine who's a doctor, and he, he the article talked about this town in Montana where Max Baucus is from, and the town was Libby, Montana, and there was some kind of asbestos manufacturing or something. That, that was happening there that was a total environmental disaster, and people were really getting sick. And so the interesting thing that Max Baucus decided to do for this one little town was that they, they tried the legal way. They tried suing the company, and that didn't work. So what he decided to, and, and I believe this was written into the Affordable Care Act by Max Baucus, for this one town of Libby, Montana, to have a single-payer system because he knew it was the cheapest way to deal with this kind of situation. So there you go with that. Um, another thing I thought I'd share with you since I have the time, it's a joke that was told to me by a, a woman whose father was a doctor uh, in the United States, and this was his favorite joke. Uh, for those of you who have not been in the single payer movement, uh, one of the things that we, the common thing we all say is, oh, if it could only happen in our lifetime, right? So here's the joke. A doctor, an American doctor, dies and goes to heaven, and he's told he can ask at the pearly gates one question to God. So the doctor goes, God, when are we gonna get, or are we gonna get single payer? God thinks about it for a minute, he goes, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is, yes, we are going to get single payer. The bad news, not in my lifetime. <laughs> so now that I've run out of material, how many more minutes do we have to go? <laughs> um, I, I did want to mention at the... Um, three more minutes. Three more minutes? Okay. I wanted to mention, I was going to thank Pascal um, in my talk on the air, and I will, but Pascal is doing, uh, oh God, live streaming, is that what it's called? Live streaming? Yes, yes, so that means that we're gonna be reaching out to a lot of people, and I just wanted to really thank her for doing that for us. Yes, Pascal is a great asset in this community, and we really appreciate her. So, how many more minutes do I have now? <laughs> Got three minutes, oh God. Um, oh gee, what else can I talk about? The bus, the bus, please sign up for the bus. The last time I heard we had 16 people signed up. The bus holds 55. It's a free bus. They're even gonna include food for us too. So um, I highly encourage you to do that either online or we give you the opportunity out in the lobby to do it right here and now. Uh, if the bus uh, meets at uh, Kmart. Um, it's going to leave at 12 o'clock, so be there at a quarter of, and the rally itself is from uh, 1 to 5. What day? Uh, this Friday, thank you. <laughs> this Friday the 19th. I'm going to say this all on the radio, but sure, we can talk about it some more here. Um, Friday the 19th. Friday the 19th. 11.45. Um, at 11.45, show up at Kmart. The bus is going to leave at 12. And it, it's, uh, the whole thing is over at five, so I would imagine we return here about six. And so, pardon? Postcards. Postcards, so are you all filling out your postcards to your representatives? You know, all you have to do is, is you know, tell them about it and then just drop it in the box and we'll mail it for you. Yes, Donna. No, one minute. Oh, one minute, oh, thank you. <laughs> I've got one minute to go. Uh, Where's the bus going? Lobby day. Lobby day. Sign up. 
In the lobby. Lobby day. Sign up in the lobby. Yes. I'm so glad I have all these people helping me here. What else can you tell me? <laughs> Where's the bus going? The bus is going to the Capitol in Sacramento. Yeah, you're welcome. For lobby day. Paul, are we getting there? Get close? Okay. Oh, it's uh, one minute to go. One minute to go. I'd sing for you, but I have a terrible voice and you would not want to hear that. <laughs> what, what? What kind of food? You know, guys, I want to just tell you, look at everybody here in this audience. If we all show up on the 19th, our legislators will know we mean business. Yeah. We have the people, they have the money. I'm going to ask you all to make a concerted effort to try and show up, because we can do this this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ernestine, for making things so abundantly clear. And now, for the benefit of our listening audience who is joining us live from KVMR, we are gathered at the Nevada Theater while we're having a town hall on health care and Senate Bill 562, the Healthy California Act guaranteeing health care for all Californians. This event is a collaboration of several activist groups pursuing health care reform. They include Gold Country, Yuba, and Women's Indivisible Groups, the Green Party, Nevada County Democratic Party, Peace and Justice Center, and Healthcare for All, Nevada County Chapter. I'm Mindy Oberg, your MC for the evening. I chair the Nevada County Chapter of Healthcare for All. HCA is a statewide, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that has been educating the public about single payer since 1995, creating a grassroots movement. Our chapter is now a regional coordinator with the Healthy California Campaign, working to pass SB 562. We get legislative updates and announcements for actions that we will share with the community at our monthly HCA meetings. Please join us the fourth Saturday of each month at the UU Community of the Mountains on Church Street in Grass Valley from 11 to 1. Our next meeting is April 27th. I'd also like to uh, let listeners know that if you like what you hear tonight, you can show your support for SB 562 by going to HealthyCaliforniaAct.org. That's three words and California is spelled out, HealthyCaliforniaAct.org, and sign on your support. From there, you can go to the events calendar and you will notice May 19th is Lobby Day at the Capitol in Sacramento from 1 to 5. The Democratic Convention is also happening. This is a very important event to attend as we need to show our Democratic representatives just how much support there is for this bill. There will be a rally with the California Nurses Association and Nina Turner, after which we'll march to the Democratic Convention. There is a link online to register for the free bus and registration closes tomorrow at 9 a.m. Before I introduce our guest speaker and panelist, I want to take this time to give a special thanks to KVMR, Nevada Theater's Tom Taylor, Paul Emery, Mikhail Graham, Pascal Yubinet, and all of our sponsors for making this evening possible. Our three panelists joining us tonight are Catherine Kennedy, a registered nurse of 37 years who now serves on the board of directors for the California Nurses Association and the National Nurses United. Keith McCallan is a physician's assistant who is currently a full-time Sacramento-based healthcare activist. Dr. Aldebra Schroll, who is trained in family medicine, hospice, and palliative care, is a member of the Physicians for a National Health Program. Thank you all for being here and welcome. Our featured guest speaker, Our featured guest speaker for this evening is Michael Lighty, currently Director of Public Policy for National Nurses United. Michael has been a major contributor for helping craft Senate Bill 562. After Michael speaks, the League of Women Voters of Placer County will facilitate the Q&A with Pam as our moderator. And so, without further ado, here's Michael.
Thank you, Mindy, very much. And it is a real honor and a pleasure to be here in Nevada City. I uh, have not had this pleasure before, and immediately I got the sense that precisely these are the kinds of communities, this is the kind of community that is what makes California great. And it embodies those values, caring, compassion, community, that we want to have our healthcare system reflect. Because ultimately, when we look at healthcare, when we talk about healthcare, we're talking about the fundamental values of our society. And those values, from the point of view of registered nurses, must be caring, compassion, and community. But it also goes beyond that. Because when we talk about healthcare, we're also talking about justice. Because ultimately, if, as Dr. King said, the lack of healthcare is the most inhumane form of injustice. And when we talk about health care, we're also talking about equality and fairness. We have a Nobel Prize winning economist who won the prize in 2015, and he says in his analysis that health care is one of the greatest drivers, if not the biggest driver, of inequality in our country. When we look at comparisons between the United States and other countries, we find that there are tremendous differences in outcomes and life expectancies. When you drill down and look at those numbers, you realize that in fact, most of those disparities between the United States and the rest of the world in terms of life expectancy derive because communities of color and low-income people do not have quality health care. And so our health care, our disparities, our social disparities actually derive in large part from lack of access to health care. So when we talk about health care, we're talking about the fundamental values of our society. So we must create a system that reflects those values. And if we don't, then we have literally shortchanged ourselves in the most personal and intimate way of our lives. So when we look at SB 562 in California, it's in that context. It's because it does something very fundamental and very important. It establishes health care as a human right for all in California. Are we ready to do that? Yeah. Yeah. And this, this is an extraordinary moment because we actually control our own health care destiny in California. Don't let anyone, whether it's Governor Brown or someone else, tell you we can't do this in California. Because in the next breath, they'll tell you that we're the fifth or sixth largest economy by GDP in the world. They will tell you that of all the states in the country, it is California that has led the economic recovery since the Great Recession. Not Texas, but California. It's not any other state that is leading the country in terms of environmental policy. It's California. And so we must assert that same leadership in healthcare, and we have the resources to do it. And the extraordinary thing about SB 562 is that it is not some liberal panacea. It's not some liberal reform. It is actually the most fiscally responsible way to guarantee health care for everyone. That, and it, don't take my word for it. Uh, you may have heard of Charlie Munger. He's a well-known uh, donor to Republican uh, candidates and issues. In fact, he's the co-chair of Berkshire Hathaway. And what did he say this, this last week? He believes single payer is the only way that we can organize health care in order to eliminate the competitive disadvantage that American corporations are currently experiencing. Small business owner in the New York Times, that's right, that's right. Small business owner in the New York Times says only single payer is going to be able to actually provide health care for me and my employees in a stable and sustainable way. You've got the Nobel economist I referenced, Angus Deaton, a mainstream economist, says not only that health care is a driver of inequality, but only again a Medicare for all type system can actually end the political corruption that characterizes our current system. Now these are very mainstream views, and we reflect those views in SB 562. What do we do? We guarantee choice of provider. You can go to any doctor. You are a or, or other provider. You have comprehensive benefits. Everything that Medi-Cal, Medicare, ACA, private insurance coverage is included in SB 562 and more. We no more narrow networks, no more insurance company premiums, no more insurance company deductibles, no more copays. Yeah. That's right. That's right. 
it is simply, it, people say, oh, it decay, it's too good to be true. Well, in fact, every other industrialized country is doing it, so it can't be too good to be true, right? And also, the truth is, 70% of healthcare expenses in California are already paid by taxes. We have a publicly funded system, we're just not getting our money's worth. And aren't we a little tired of that? I think we're a little tired of that. I mean, really, I, I, it's, to my business friends, I say, hey, do you just normally give 20 cents on the dollar to something that adds no value to your bottom line? Because that's what you're doing to the health insurance, with the health insurance companies. They're taking 20% off the top and doing nothing with it, except denying us care that we need. So we eliminate that model in favor of putting doctors and nurses in charge of health care. Oh, that's a radical idea, right? That's right. That's not going to be insurance company bureaucrats. It's not going to be uh, the algorithm, whoever he is or she is, right? It's not going to be the practice models or the guidelines or the technology. It's not going to be like, oh, I'm going to practice to a computer instead of look at my patient. That's not what it's going to be. It's going to be based on that primary relationship between the provider and the patient. And that is something that no other health care reform offers, that you can actually put providers in charge and their clinical judgment in charge. And we establish a single universal standard of safe therapeutic care. In essence, we have an historic opportunity, but most importantly, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility not only to ourselves and our children and our grandchildren, but to society as a whole to say, yes, we can do it. The California dream lives, and we can enact it with an extraordinary health care system that will guarantee health care for all as a matter of human right. And isn't that really why we're here? To create that peace of mind for everyone. Thank you very much. I'm Pam Hart with the Foster County League of Women Voters, and we already have some cards, but keep writing your questions and raise your hand in the air, and someone will come and collect them and we'll get them answered for you. Um, uh, panelists, um, do you want to say something real quick about how this would affect you in one minute or less, starting with Catherine? How it would affect me mm -hmm. as far as single payer? Well, you know what? Um, as a mother and as a grandmother and as a registered nurse, I think that you know having not having to worry about how to pay for health care is something that you know I have always you know I want it to happen in my lifetime. Um, you know I have five kids, seven grandchildren, and I worry every day as to whether or not they're going to be able to access and have health care. So you know I. For me, I think it's imperative, and as a nurse, to have to see every day people that struggle with, you know, do I pay for my premiums? Do I go to the doctors, or do I put food on the table? You know, what do I do? I mean, we hear this every day, so you know, I think it will make a huge difference, and I do want to see this in my lifetime. I think we can do it, and it's going to be done. Thank you, Keith, as a physician's assistant. Want to give us your view? Uh, the, the main reason that I'm an activist is to get into a big fight here because I really don't want my kids to have to get into this big fight. Um, I started off this in, in a family practice down in Salinas and I ended up, without really knowing it, but being an activist at that point, um, getting in fights with the local CEO at the hospital, getting in a fight with insurance companies, um, even other physicians who seem to forget what healthcare was all about. So that's, that's one of the big reasons. Um, secondly, I would have to say that the other reason is, is I really would like to go back to being a healthcare provider. I've switched careers to become that. I was quite good at it. I enjoyed it. But right now, it's time to fix healthcare. And so um, it would allow me to go back to do what I think is my best contribution. Thank you. And I would have to answer in a similar light in the sense that um, I started as a primary care physician and I found that it was a constant battle, was trying to sort out what is this going to be covered or not covered, to the point that actually it interfered with medicine. 
Patients did not want to tell you their medical history because they were afraid they would be tagged with a pre-existing condition. And I can't work like that. I can't do my job if patients can't open up. So it would, and I'm afraid that's probably going to start, we're going to start seeing that again. If we, um, this falls apart and pre-existing conditions again become a concern, people may not want to share their history with their providers and, and we can't do our job. Thank you very much. I'm going to read these questions and anyone can answer. And if you have additional comments, please give them. But I would also like for you to say your name first so that the listening audience recognizes who is speaking. Thank you. Is anyone working with Los Angeles County regarding SB 562? LA's population and diversity from rich to poor should be able to move this bill to law. Uh, it's Michael Leidy, uh, California Nurses Association. We are working with LA County. In fact, one of the first meetings we did after the first of the year with uh, was with Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, who was an author, of course, and leader in the fight to do a Medicare for All type system in California. And uh, the questioner is correct. LA County really uh, will be the a key driver for this reform, and they've got a uh, public health director, Mitch Katz, who has experience with universal health care, having helped uh, Lieutenant Governor Newsom set up that system uh, with Supervisor Amiano in San Francisco, where they do have a, a, a publicly uh, funded universal health care system. So we do think that LA County will be a major uh, driver of reform and that ultimately, uh, if it works in LA County, then it will work in the rest of the state. So we are working closely with, with those policymakers. Thank you. Um, how would our fair share be collected? Is 12% annual cost per person who has an income realistic for a California single payer program? Um, it's Michael Lady, we can, others can definitely chime in. I mean, we're, we're um, it's not gonna be 12%. Um, we are completing the finance study and that will be released um, Monday, May 22nd at the Appropriations Committee. That's the current plan and that's the process in Sacramento. When you have a bill that does have a fiscal impact on the state budget, it goes through Appropriations Committee and, and we will be doing that with this bill. Uh, certainly, um, 95% of people, as, as we've done in prior studies, will pay less um, than they do now. And even for those folks who, because of their upper income, may end up paying more, the benefit program is much richer. And the full choice of provider, no insurance company bureaucrats looking over your shoulder, no insurance company premiums, deductibles, even those folks who, by virtue of their ability to do so, may end up paying more, will have a much richer benefit uh, program. So we do think that, that the financing will come in and, and be surprising to people. I think they'll be, um, we saw a film earlier where one of the um, business owners from Canada said, what's a copay, right? And that's maybe a favorite line. That's what we want. We want our grandchildren to ask that question, right? What's a copay? <laughs> and that would be victory. Uh, so I, I'm gonna go back to that first question because I don't wanna miss the opportunity. Uh, regarding Los Angeles, regarding Sacramento, regarding San Francisco, any of these places, call your friends, call your families in those areas and tell them to get in touch with Healthcare for All California. Tell them to get in touch with the Healthy California campaign. The way that those communities are going to rise up is if we all rise up and we really have to spur one another on. Um, as a healthcare activist, that's really what we're up against, I would have to say. Thank you, Keith. What effect will this have on businesses? Um, this, is, this is Catherine Kennedy from CNA. And I'm, I, I want to say that my husband is a dentist, so he's, he's self-employed and he has um, employees. And one of the things that he has struggled with is to try to provide health care for his employees. I think with SB 562, he's not going to have to worry about that anymore. I mean, even watching the video there where, you know, these businesses are able to provide health care in Canada, are able to provide health care for their employees at, at a cost, um, but it's reasonable, whereas right now it is, it's not, it's, 
it costs way too much. And then to the cost sharing for his employees, it's, it's hard. So I think it would benefit small businesses. And when I, when I, this is Michael Lighty. When I said peace of mind, for business owners, this really truly offers it because you no longer have the hassle of deciding, gee, do I give my employees a raise or keep paying health insurance? Do I lay off someone so I can afford, afford health insurance for others? I can't even afford health insurance for anyone, so am I going to be able to keep my, my employees? What about employees coming to work sick because they don't have health coverage? All of that goes away and replaced by a publicly financed system that guarantees health care and that the business owners don't have to worry about. That, and at the same time, for those who are providing, many businesses who are providing health insurance will pay 15, 20% of payroll for those health plans, right? As we know, this will be much less than that, perhaps as much as half of that or less than half of that. So that's, that's the real advantage. No more hassle, no more, you know, somebody taking 20 cents out of the dollar for no value, and guaranteed health care for all your workers and yourself. It's, it's a very, very high level of health security for business. Um, and also, I, so I'm not a, I'm a health care provider, so um, that, that's my forte. Um, but in terms of businesses, I'm certainly keeping my ears to open and, uh, and listening to what's going on. I listened to a podcast just last night of a venture capitalist talking to Ezra Klein, who uh, quite frankly is not, his opinions are not, uh, I, don't, I, I take him to task on a lot of things. Um, also a Washington Post article, and both the venture capitalist and the CPA in the Washington Post article were talking about businesses and how businesses are really fed up with our health care system. Um, I would love to hear more businesses come out and state that clearly um, and get on board with SB 562 specifically, but fixing health care in this country generally. Thank you, Keith. And I would just encourage, sorry, Pam, I would just encourage uh, business owners to join the Business Alliance for Healthy California. They have a website, Business Alliance for Healthy California. And also, if you are a business owner and support 562, make sure that your legislator knows that. Business owners can be, will be very important in this fight. Need your voices heard. Thank you. Physicians are worried that if California goes single payer alone, the state will be flooded with low income people from other states, bursting the system and overwhelming the providers. Can any California residency um, requirements be added to this? Will health care for all cover non-state residents? How long must residents be in the state before they are covered? Uh, Michael Lighty again. The, um, uh, the truth is, is that um, this program will have the same residency requirements um, that uh, Medi-Cal has that this has to be your primary residence in California. Now, I tend to think, given the actual reality of California, that housing prices have as much to do with whether people live in this state as anything else. And I don't see lots of people move into California um, because you are gonna be required to have a primary residence. That's, that's the basis of it. If you can't prove that, then you're not eligible. I think, in, 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 you know, maybe the other, maybe the providers want to talk about this because we think that's an important principle, right? That you don't discriminate whether your patient and you know whatever demographic. And I think that principle that we're all in this together has to be the basis for the healthcare system. So we we think that there is, and we'll have everyone in the same system, so we'll be able to catch the outliers, the non-residents, the fraud. We will have the ability to enforce that. But the primary point is we are all in this together, and we've got to create the healthcare system that works for everybody in the state. We'll be able to enforce those who don't belong or aren't eligible. But the bottom line's got to be first health security and guaranteed health care. I'm amazed more people aren't coming to California for Yosemite alone. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, the, I treat the patient in front of me. I, in Salinas, I had a, a broad spectrum of patients that covered uh, everyone from undocumented field workers up to city leaders, and, and you, you take care of the person that's in front of you. I would, I would agree with that. I'll never stroll here. But um, I would imagine there'll be some method by the time they actually, they'll have a card or some way to demonstrate that by the time we see them, they have already probably been screened. 
That's right, and it's also true that the bill has a care coordinator where you have to sign up with a care coordinator to get, you know, not to get services, but for your providers to be paid for services. So there is a mechanism there too. And we can, and we'll continue, that's the kind of elaboration we need to do as we move forward implementation. What will happen to the Kaiser systems? <laughs> Kathy Kennedy, they'll still be there. <laughs> they will. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it isn't a matter of um, getting away from or getting rid of uh, a health system. It's more about really a single payer, really getting the insurance company out. Michael, you can help me here. But, you know, I, I, I think that, again, it's, it's really allowing the physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner to be, and, and the patient to be able to look at what care is needed and getting the insurance portion of Kaiser out. Uh, this is Keith McCallan. Um, yeah, so I'm a Kaiser member, um, and I think Kaiser is in, a, is in a, a very good position to do quite well under a SB under SB 562. Um, they're an integrated system. Um, I'm a primary care provider, and so that is a great concern to me. I want people um, to I want someone watching over the entire person so that they're not going off and and getting procedures without, let's say, getting their blood sugars checked. I came across that problem. Um, I guess the thought that I would have regarding Kaiser is I wish they would come on board with this. I'm not really interested with Kaiser's national expansion um, hopes and dreams. Right now, they are a healthcare provider in California. They can become a very positive part of SB 562. That's what I would encourage them to do. Right now, I wonder whether it's just the, their early fight. So um, keep up the new, on the news regarding Kaiser. I, you know, Michael Lighty, I would agree with that, Keith, and I think, I really do believe that Kaiser tells us, hey, we want to compete on quality, right? We want to be a high quality provider. Well, what's better for a system where you separate what you pay for health care from the health care you get? Because you get under SB 562, you'll get the health care you need rather than just the health care you can pay for. So that system is great for Kaiser. And, and it, but we also saw today a report that was delivered to Congress uh, about how the insurance companies are exploiting and defrauding Medicare. How are they doing that? They're Medicare Advantage. Do we have anyone in Medicare Advantage here? Kaiser, right? Well, it turns out that those plans are actually ripping Medicare off. So when we hear Kaiser, if it's just a matter of, hey, the doctors and the hospitals are going to continue to exist under SB 562, so you guys are going to have an advantage, well, that argument doesn't prevail. Instead, they say, we need the health plan. Well, what does the health plan do? The health plan, apparently, through Medicare Advantage, is part of the problem with Medicare. The health plan is the one driving the revenue so they can expand nationally. The health plan is not good for California. We love the Kaiser system, the nurses, the doctors, but the health plan's gotta go, and that's the bottom line. So as a senior citizen, how will this affect my Medicare? Well, it's going to be very good for senior citizens because number one, we're going to take over Part B, right? So that that Part B supplemental insurance taken care of by SB 562, and then, and then we're going to negotiate with the drug companies and take get rid of that donut hole in Part D. And, and if we're successful, everyone, not only the folks. Um, in Medicare, obviously, but everyone will get the uh, benefits that are not currently provided by Medicare, like dental and vision, for example. So we expand the benefits, and we integrate those that now currently you get through Medi-Cal. Some of the folks who are over 65 also get benefits through Medi-Cal, depending on income and services, and we integrate all that. So for folks on Medicare now, it becomes a much more, uh, again, better benefits and a much more integrated system and relieving uh, the burden of some of the co-pays uh, that you currently have. How can we be sure the government can't borrow, beg, or steal from this money as they did from Social Security? <laughs> well, don't blame us for the federal government. <laughs> Look, we put it in a dedicated trust fund that can be exclusively by law, by our direction in the bill, can be only cover and pay for healthcare expenses. So this is not part of the general fund. It's in a segregated 
Healthy California Trust Fund for the exclusive purpose of paying for health care in California. That is a big deal because it tells providers there's going to be a source of income for swift, reliable payment. They're not going to have to beg, borrow, and steal from insurance companies to get paid. That dedicated funding source then relieves the general fund of all those health care responsibilities, and Californians are going to be able to hold their elected officials accountable for how that money is spent. So it's transparent, it's accountable, and it's democratic, and it's dedicated. So it's a much better way to fund health care. here again. Um, so as an activist, I think that part where that says we have to hold our leaders accountable, I think, I, I don't, what I think we should be careful of is to say, okay, let's pass 562 and then we all go home and it runs on autopilot from now on. I think one of the things, one of the difficulties that we're, that I'm having as an activist trying to rally the citizenry to realize just what an incredible opportunity we have right there uh, before us in SB 562 is that if we get people to standing and fighting for this, we can also begin to teach them how to, to defend it once it gets passed. Um, that's gonna be really quite important. And, and I think it, it, I look at the audiences that I, I always look at demographics, who am I talking to? And right now we're, we're looking to a, an older demographic. Is that fair to say with, yes. with great respect? Um, but, but, we're, but I really struggle. I go, when I go out to table, I go out and seek out these people, when I go, the, the younger demographic, the millennials. So when I go out to uh, individual groups and to uh, resist Sacramento and resist groups, I go there to contact these people to get in touch. And it's out there. It's slowly, because uh, we can thank Trump for this and, and the election and the ongoing nonsense is in the newspapers daily. They're there. They're starting to organize, but they need encouragement. They need to be taught how to do that. Um, and I think if we get the older demographic teaching the younger demographic teaching the older demographic, then SB 562 will not only pass, but it will become an amazing success story that will allow a single-payer healthcare system to sweep across this country. Let's understand it. So right now that a lot of primary care providers are leaving the state and, and terminating their businesses. And already we have a shortage, especially in rural areas. What can we do to make sure that health, better health care will be allowed to all these people? Do we have enough medical services to meet the higher demand? That. I'll never shrill here. So as having been a primary care physician, um, I left my office because I was burned out on the insurance industry and dealing with that nonsense. I think we will attract people to a state with single payer because it will make things it'll just be smoother. It's, it's exhausting to, to, from every day, try to, you know, deal with these insurance companies. At one time it was about 70 to $80,000 that a primary care physician would spend to actually just get paid. That's the administrative cost. And I'm going back probably a decade or so because that's been that long for me. Um, I think physicians will be attracted, especially these young people coming out of, they're very active and they're very savvy. Um, I see when I attend single payer meetings, a lot of medical students are interested in this. Uh, Keith McAllen, um, so absolutely the, the, the cost per provider um, to just keep up with the nonsense to fight insurance companies, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind regarding um, fixing health care is, and this is something that's not often discussed, but I think it's one of the most more amazing things about health uh, care in this country, is that we have an army of mid-levels that are, ha, ha, have been at it for, for decades now, and nurse practitioners and physicians, uh, physis, uh, physicians assistants, which is of course my profession, I'm stumbling over here. The reason that I was the only PA in a four-doc practice in Salinas is because I was good for business. I was able to see the patients that couldn't get in to see the doc, so I was able to triage for the, for the company. Under a single payer system, that would just, that would make the number of patients that we could see grow much larger. Um, so, I, so I think the mid-levels is one of the things that's going to be very good for uh, SB 562. All of us know doctors, it's Michael Leidy, all of us know doctors who have left the system as you have. 
and it's exactly right. I mean, my endocrinologist is like, I'm not going to go to electronic medical records. It's just, you know, that's going to take me away from my patients. Um, these medical groups, they'll spend $75,000 a year just dealing with the insurers they have to, they have to bill from. And, we're, and Pam, I think really to get to the heart of that question, we're going to improve the practice environment for physicians, ensuring that they get paid swiftly and reliably, stop the insurance bureaucrats from looking over their shoulder, telling them how to practice medicine, and just like we did with registered nurses, which Catherine could tell you, we passed a law in California, only in the nation, to limit the number of nurses, that, limit the number of patients nurses take care of on each shift, and that has improved the practice environment so that 100,000 nurses came to California to practice again. And so that's exactly the kind of thing. When you have clinicians in charge, clinicians want to work in the system. No surprise. We're going to raise Medi-Cal reimbursement rates. They're 50, 60% of Medicare. We're going to put them up to the Medicare rates. Primary care physicians will no longer be the stepchild in the medical system. They'll be the heart of the medical system because it's the relationship between the primary care provider and the patient that will drive the whole system, will drive utilization, will drive appropriate use of care, will drive the allocation of resources. So when you, again, you put clinicians in charge, they're going to want to be a part of that system. I have to throw in, it sounds like we're selling this and everything is, is, is golden and beautiful and it's all perfect. I have on my Twitter page that they're up at the top on the banner, there is no reasonable argument against single payer. The only reason that I'm a healthcare activist is because there is no reasonable argument against the single payer. SB 562 is a beautifully crafted uh, piece of legislation. Um, you know, does it have shortcomings and things we have to work on? Absolutely. But um, when you hear Michael Leidy speak and, and the nurses speak about it, th th there's no nonsense there. We point out the shortcomings and we say these are the things we're going to need to work on. We're going to need to work on long-term care. We're going to need to work on workers' compensation. Um, but generally speaking, given where we are now, which is nowhere good, fixing the system is absolutely necessary. And SB 562, as the rest of the world has, has taught us, the single-payer system, it's the answer. It is, it is the antidote for our problem. So you mentioned workers' comp there uh, in a brief breath. So will people on workers' comp also be covered in the same system? Uh, eventually, yes. Um, the workers' comp system is complicated. Um, obviously, we want to take on everything we can, but we did have to defer that one. So the bill requires that within two years, that the system will f incorporate the medical portion of workers' comp. Now, the issues are, of course, you've got um, some employers, very few, but some who create unsafe workplaces, so you need to make sure there's a disincentive for them to do that. You don't want to relieve them of all the costs associated with an unsafe workplace if it generates in injuries. So we have to balance that with the idea that we want to take medical expenses out of that whole equation. So that's what we've got to figure out. And how would this coverage work if you have to travel and you have an emergency in another state or another country? There's very specific provisions in the bill for out-of-state care. And just like other countries, uh, like Canadians, uh, when they come to the U.S., Californians who have their primary residence here would be able to get care out-of-state covered by this program. And there is some elaborate, I mean, it's, we do spend some time in the bill uh, figuring that out. And I think you mentioned right uh, at your very beginning of your talk that the financials are still being worked out. And so is it the same type of um, system that the Federal Congressional Budget Office is? And they're looking at how it would affect the budget? Well, I can go into a little more detail if, if you like, okay. um, Pam. So what, what we do is we consolidate all the existing revenues. Remember I said that 70% of personal health expenses in California are paid by taxes? That comes from, a, obviously, federal government as well as the state and local governments. So what we do is we take all those funding streams that exist now under the Affordable Care Act, under Medi-Cal, for example, and under the programs called CHIP and other public health spending. We put those all in one pot. And what we're replacing is we're replacing the premiums, deductibles, and co-pays that individuals and employers pay privately through insurance uh, companies. And so that portion we finance through public financing. 
taxes, and it's a replacement of those existing spending. So it's, it's, it's a consolidation of existing resources and the generation of new revenue only to the extent we have to replace existing ones. And we're estimating that even if we cover the additional 3 million who are uninsured in California, and 35% of Californians are underinsured. For example, a doctor they need is not in their network. They have a high deductible, $5,000, $10,000 deductible. They can't, 20% of people who declare medical bankruptcy do so with insurance, with insurance. So having insurance does not give you health care. That's part of the problem. We eliminate that problem. So when we do all that, we save, even though we cover everybody, we save 10% in what our current spending level. So we're able to actually raise less revenue in order to, um, in order to fund fully the system. And this assumes comprehensive benefits. So on Monday at the um, Senate Appropriations Committee, we'll be discussing the financing plan. And I think, I think folks who have been skeptical will be surprised. But remember, the argument, you hear the argument, oh, Medicare for all, single payer costs too much. Well, actually, everybody knows it costs less in the present system. What they're talking about is they don't want to spend it through government. But look, at 70% is already spent through government. So what kind of argument is that? It's not, it's, everyone knows single payers cost less. And when we talk about all these issues, physician shortage, um, the, the problems with access now, all of that is going to be worse under the present system. What is the, what is the possibility for change under the present system versus SB 562? When you do that comparison, then the argument looks very favorable to 562. Callan, um, I, I heard a stat the other day that, that just blew me away. I often tell people we're not looking to, we're not looking to take a good system, tweak it a little bit, and make it better. We're, we're looking to take a vicious, lousy, profiteering system and replace it. There is the, there's a st the stat that I heard was that 46% of Americans would have trouble handling a $400 ER bill. So let, we, we need to walk into this with our eyes wide open and understand that we really need to fix our system. We are, as a percent of GDP, it keeps rising. Our leaders tell us, but it's not rising as fast, but, but it's still rising at, at, a, at an arc that it's, it's queued up to, be, you know, to, to uh, cause the next e economic crash. So we really have to attend to this concern. But I also think we have to understand who we are as, as a people in this state, um, since we're talking about SB 562, um, we have trouble paying our medical bills, and as a result, we're getting sick, and SB 562 is an answer to that. Yeah. You know, this is Kathy Kennedy. Um, you know, and as a nurse, one of the things that I've, I've heard from my other nurse colleagues, and I think I mentioned this before, is people have to, they're making choices. They may have insurance, but they can't go to the doctors because they can't afford the copay, or they can't afford the medication that they need because it's really high. I heard last night of a young lady who has significant allergies, and the EpiPen, which costs an arm and a leg now, is, is something that should never have happened. And so this young lady, you know, she, she protects her EpiPen, but she doesn't want to use it because then she you can't afford to buy another one. Now, how silly is that? You know, so, you know, I think we, we do need to fight. We need to guarantee that every, this is a right for every human being, no matter who they are. And really, we need to take the profit out of healthcare. Nobody should profit on what we need. <laughs> Up and they approach this thing as a partisan position, from a partisan position. I'm out there, I'm an independent in my entire life, and I'm just really all about fixing the problem. I find, though, that as I've studied uh, the need to fix health care from a professional perspective as well as from an activist perspective, is that this is really not a partisan position. But if you really want to play that game, I think the, co the conservatives have the best argument for fixing health care via a single payer system. Now is the time. Um, we saw a condensed version. Um, we should kind of coordinate and organize a full 
watching the full version because it's really quite good. Also online uh, for free, 55 minutes long, the Fix It movie, Fix It um, at FixItHealthcare.com. Go watch that one. That's a conservative argument for um, for single payer, and it's it's fairly powerful. I get really good response to that one. And now let's talk about the comparisons to the Canadian system. So we hear that the Canadians come to the United States when they want the best health care. And what is the response for those who claim long waiting lines for services in the Canadian system? Well, my, it's Michael Leidy. My, um, I was talking to my mom who's on Medicare, and um, she uh, has some um, lung issues. And so it, she was really excited because she got an appointment with her pulmonologist on June 24th. So, I, and this is in fact the Commonwealth Fund, which has done these comparative international studies, has found the wait times in the U.S. quite comparable to Canada in many respects. And I don't think it's atypical for someone to have, have to wait 30 plus days to get a specialist appointment in this country. So, uh, there's that. But look, at every healthcare system ultimately decides who gets care and who doesn't. You can call that rationing. In our, in our system, it's rationed by ability to pay. If you don't have the money, you don't get the care. Every other country with the national health care system says no. You're going to get the care you need within the constraints of the system. And those constraints are budget. So in Canada, they're making choices. And they will tell you that. And they will be upfront about that. They will say, if you need um, even a knee or hip replacement that is not causing debilitating pain, you will wait longer than someone who needs a knee who is in debilitating pain. So, and, so those will be based on severity of, of illness, not on ability to pay. You'll also, if you ask any Canadian, would you trade the U.S. healthcare system? <laughs> you will not find a Canadian who lives in Canada who says that, generally. Now, this is literally Canada, Canadians, their most revered leader is Tommy Douglas, who started Canadian Medicare. Canada, Canadians are not giving up on Medicare. They're going to try to fix it because it has issues too and problems. But I think overall, and you can talk to physicians who practice in both countries, and you'll find that this, the practice environment in Canada is much preferable. For those patients who are um, wealthy, there still is the ability to go outside the system in Canada. So um, there is that, that valve for the, for the healthy, but I, for the wealthy. But I, what I would say, finally, though, is that still, you look at across the board, the Canadian measures of outcome are better than, than the U.S., and they spend less per capita. So there isn't, on that, I think on that level, the case is very strong. But we are not instituting a Canadian system. We are instituting a California system based upon the needs of California. That's what this is about. That's a big point. An all American healthcare system because I, I get a lot of people when I'm out tabling are like, I don't want to become, you know, take on the Canadian system. They kind of complain about information coming in from Europe and from Canada. SB 562 is, is not, it's, it's all Californian and it really speaks to the concerns that we have in this state, which is what makes it such a nice bill. Well worth the read. It might take a second time to really get into it though. <laughs> Will SB 562 cover health care at home? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how will homeless people without a permanent resident be um, able to uh, qualify for this care? Well, we, we are um, optimists, and so we very much um, hope that the new initiatives that LA County and San Francisco and other places are doing uh, will really um, eradicate homelessness. But until then, um, we are committed to making sure that those folks who are homeless do get the services they need. And most, most homeless people are in touch with their public health systems. They're either first responders have contact with them or um, public health workers. So uh, we do believe that we'll be able to actually better meet their needs because the systems that they go to, primarily the public hospitals, will have more resources under SB 562, and so covering those who are um, would be homeless and have high medical needs, they'd actually have more resources to cover them. So we're optimistic that we can both better meet their needs 
and ensure they still have they have real access beyond what they have now. Keith uh, McAllen again. I I guess the, one of the thoughts that I've had regarding changing our healthcare system is it's not something that someone else can come in and do to really make. I don't think that SB 562 will really blossom into an amazing healthcare system for a generation. A lot of the concerns we have really are cultural. It's things we really have to get into a fight with and say, what is the family dynamic? What is the concerns that we need to attend to? Um, how do we deal with, with the, you know, the end of life issues? Those are not something that can be handed down from a leader or cobbled together by by uh, people writing bills. That's something that we have to take a look at our own situation, our own families, our own town, and our own state and say, how do we move forward um, and make changes? And that's, it's not gonna be easy, but I think SB 562 changes everything and it allows us to have that conversation. Um, I guess one of the, one, going back to the, to the knee replacements, it, I don't know, I, I had a lot of patients who would come in and they would be raging at me because we, I didn't get them into the orthopedist to get their new knee. And, and my thought is, look, you've been limping for five years and so you wake up one morning and because you heard your best friend got a new knee, you want a new knee, and now I'm gonna tell you you have to wait to see the orthopedist, you're gonna get upset about that? Uh, so, I, I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm speaking a bit facetiously here, but I think there's a point that's, that, that's in there. We, we just have to understand what is healthcare, how do we maintain health? That's one of the things we have to take a look at. This is uh, Kathy Kennedy. <laughs> you know, there was a, a physician, I was at a town hall meeting in Roseville in March, and he was an, uh, an, a retired physician. And he said something at that town hall meeting that has stuck with me, and I wanted to share it with you. What he talked about was, he said, insurance. You have insurance for your house, so if your house burns down, you have the insurance to rebuild, right? And then if you have a woman car, you have auto insurance. So if your car is totaled, you can replace that car. That's not an issue. So why do we have to have insurance for health care? It should be assurance that all of us have guaranteed health care because we are worth it and we can't replace ourselves. We can't replace you. So you're worth it. And it, and it should be a right. So I think about that all the time. And 562, if we do it here in California, everybody else will look at us and, and they will see the light. But it's worth it. Does SB 562 standardize the cost of procedures? And how would SB 562 change the enormous profit that hospitals are making under the current medical insurance system? Well, the, um, yeah, you, you eliminate the insurance companies and that eliminates um, much of the profit. But here's the, here's the problem overall. We've organized healthcare as an industry in this country, not as a caregiving profession. And what SB 562 says, no, we're going to organize this as a caregiving profession. And, they, and just exactly what Kathy was saying, insurance is supposed to provide security, but in the case of healthcare, it actually increases insecurity. So we're going to establish peace of mind, because that's really what you want from health insurance. You want peace of mind, and the current system can't provide it. It's unsustainable. But then if you look at this issue of, of um, how we're going to uh, eliminate uh, profit by hospitals, what you find is that the hospitals have uh, an exemption from antitrust, and that exemption derives from the Balanced Budget Act of the mid-90s that encourages them to consolidate. And when they consolidate, and the Affordable Care Act does this too, encourages hospitals to merge and become bigger. When they become bigger, they have more leverage. They use that leverage to get more money from the insurers, and then the insurers will raise their premiums, right? Well, that's fine with the hospitals, because then 
they'll charge more, and it's a nice little circle for them and a vicious circle for us. And then you throw in the drug companies, and they love that game too, because as, there, as the premiums go up, they can charge more, the hospitals can charge more for their drugs. And guess what? The free market now looks like a monopoly where all the other players, the insurers, the hospitals, and the drug companies are making out, and we're paying the price. That's the present system, and that's what we're going to change. And that's how we're going to make profit. You have to take a look at the structure that, that supports all of that. When I was a, a citizen of Salinas and a healthcare provider there, it wasn't just misbehaving hospitals. While I was there, the local nonprofit uh, community hospital got looted from within by millions, but it was, it, which is outrageous. But the reaction of the town and the politicians and, and, and the journalists that kind of ran cover for it all was, was really a disturbing experience to, to live through. Um, uh, in fact, an audit, the state auditor came in and, and the assemblyman said, get in there and do an audit on that hospital. And the auditor went in and the report was issued and the bottom line of the report said, couldn't do an audit because the local nonprofit community hospital had no transparency and so we weren't able to really dig very deeply. And then everything, nothing changed. So. That's, the, that's the crony capitalism that Angus Deaton is talking about, that Nobel Prize winning economist. He says it's crony capitalism and political corruption at its worst, and the only way to unwind it is through a Medicare for all type system, where it is transparent and accountable. And that's how, the, that's how um, this problem called healthcare in this country, it's not new. This is, this is a, a century old problem from 1912 when uh, Teddy Roosevelt first tried to fix it, and then through Truman, and then of course we all know the, the present history. It, we are up against a very big foe here, and, and they're, they're, they're big and they're everywhere. And we, so when we, when we look to fix this, when we get into discussions, we have that scope of history so that we appreciate just how big of a fight we are. When a journalist writes the kind of the DC debate, which is no debate at all, because it talks about how you can reconfigure a for-profit uh, insurance system to better effect, that's nonsense. The for-profit insurance system is the problem. That's the nice thing about SB 562, is it surgically removes the problem and replaces it with a single-payer system. So, since it sounds like insurance companies and big pharma are probably opposing, SB 562. <laughs> and, and the California legislature is overwhelmingly Democrat. Do, do you think that it has a chance to pass, or will this have to be placed on the ballot? Well, it definitely has a chance to pass. I think it goes back to what we've all been saying, you know, and, and that it sets up to us, ultimately. And it is not, it is really something that shouldn't be partisan, as Keith said. It's it is a reform that is privately delivered, publicly financed, with doctors and other providers in charge, complete choice, comprehensive benefits, better deal for business, public gets its money's worth through the taxes we pay. To me, that is a fiscally responsible approach. So, um, and, and again, the concern is, well, we don't want government to be spending that money, but the fact is, what other entity can disrupt that profit cycle? You've got to have some entity that can actually rein in prices. You've got to be able to contain costs, contain prices in order to contain costs. Why does healthcare in the U.S. cost so much? Because prices are high. Oh, who knew, right? <laughs> but that's what, that's what every other system does. They contain prices. They, the AARP, who got the AARP magazine this month, right? They're about prescription drug prices. What do they say? Why do drug companies charge so much? Because nothing is stopping them. We will stop them. And they don't like yeah. us. This is Kathy. So one of the things that, you know, I, I'm starting to get a lot more involved than I used to because I'm getting up in age and one day I too will be needing more health care than I need right now. But So I am now a delegate for my assembly district, 8, and I am going to convention. And one of the things that we are really pushing is these incumbents better know that we're knocking on their doors. And if they don't get on board with 562, they're going to be gone. So we're really excited.
and, and under the category of chance to pass here, um, it, it's a great product. I think that we go back to what we discussed at the very beginning of the Q&A here is that how's LA doing? Are they, are they mobilizing? Are they busy? How is the Bay Area? The Bay Area is actually doing quite well. I'm a little jealous of all of their amazing organizational efforts. Um, how is Sacramento doing? Um, that's where, that's, the answer to that question will, uh, to will, can we pass uh, SB 562 will come when we, we get people up and about and moving and demanding this. And on Twitter, I put out a line that said basically we should go and fix health care if for no other reason that we can prove that we can stand and get something fixed in this country. We've passed it at least twice under uh, Schwarzenegger. So there is um, momentum for that in this state. And, and honestly, the, it was vetoed by yeah. the governor at the time. <laughs> yeah. I bet you're right on that, right? And, and the truth is, is that, look, at Californians are going to look to this Democratic legislature and governor. They're not just going to accept what the GOP or, or President Trump does in Washington. They're, oh, that's fine. That's what they did. So, you know, Three million more Californians don't have health insurance. That's not what's going to happen. Californians are going to expect this government to solve the health care problem because we are the size of a country, we have the resources, we have the need, so it is on us. And we're getting a very positive response from the legislature. We moved through the health committee. Um, we're in good shape, you know, uh, in the Senate. We're going to have a fight in the assembly. Uh, and obviously, we've got a real struggle with the governor. But we can answer every single question that's been raised about finance, about coverage, about uh, operations we think we can address effectively and have so far. So we're just getting nothing but more and more support. And that's going to continue if we continue to press it. And we can't let Republicans off the hook either, because they're, they're responsible if they're going to kick millions of Californians off health insurance in, in Washington then Californian Republicans are going to have to step up too, unless they think that people should just die on the streets, which I don't believe they do, and they're going to have to have an answer to that. Well, we have to wind down a little bit here, so let's get some of these tactical questions out of the way. Can you guide us to important dates or milestones about SB 562? When does my representative need to know about how I want him or her to vote? Those Yes, by, uh, we're going, as I say, the Senate Appropriations Committee is uh, May 22nd. After that, there'll be a vote to move it to the Senate floor within a few days after that. So really, once we get to Friday of this week, we're in the final stretch to pass this bill in the Senate, because it's going to a floor vote. Um, it looks like uh, certainly by June 2nd. So this is, this is the sprint here between now and June 2nd. We've got to get every senator, and I mean every senator, on board with this bill. That's that's our objective. Then we're going to move over to the assembly, and we're going to have a fight there too. We're going to have a big fight in the assembly. Um, but again, it's going to take that grassroots pressure. And so, what is the most effective thing to do to support single payer? Mobilize, mobilize, and organize. But here, I told this to Keith earlier. Letters to the editor, very important. Letters to the editor. Show up in Sacramento on May 19th. Get on the bus on Friday at Kmart, 11 a.m. Get down to Sacramento. And when you're in Sacramento on the 19th, contact your representatives. And then afterwards, on Monday, call them again. Are you a co-sponsor? Unless they're a co-sponsor, we don't know how they're going to vote. And that's the litmus test. Are you a co-sponsor of SB 562? And the answer is yes. Until it's yes, you keep calling and writing. Uh, this is Kathy. Participate in lobbying. Lobby, lobby. They listen. And, you know, and I think, and, and that's really important. You know, as the nurses, we're out there all the time. And I see retirees lobby. Uh, yeah, Senator Gaines is not a co sponsor. <laughs> As far as lobbying, the question was lobbying, we are, there's going to be a lobby day on May 19th, the first day of the convention. So again, you know, as Michael and, and everyone else has been saying, you guys have a free bus. That's great to go down to the Capitol, um, and that, that's your opportunity to begin lobbying. You know, what lobbying is, is basically speaking truth to power, right? Sorry. Yeah. What lobbying is, is speaking truth to power. So when Kathy goes to meet with these legislators, she's the expert. 
And they really don't know what she knows. And when the, when, when the public says they want to hear more from somebody, what they say is they want to hear more from nurses. That's what the public says. So that, and so, and that's true also, you have your own experience. You have your experience in the present system. That's powerful. If you've never done lobbying before, another good reason to get on the bus on Friday and go and be a part of groups that have. So they can go into a group, meet with the staff or from your representative, see how people talk and how they, what points they use. But the most important thing, ultimately, when it comes to healthcare, because it is so personal, is having your own experience be able to communicate that effectively and link that to why this reform is necessary. Uh, Keith McAllen here. My first uh, uh, foray into activism came when Bernie was speaking at the soccer fields down in Sacramento. I had never put myself in front of a crowd um, and, and pleaded, appealed, and, and urged them to become part of it in my life. And so that first night was really difficult for about the first 10 minutes. And then I realized that these people that were streaming past me were not throwing rocks at me or anything. They were just not listening to me. So I would take each segment of the crowd as it went through and say, this is part of Bernie's revolution. Step up and sign this. Um, you know, and I did fairly well, I suppose. But what that did was I broke a sweat on it. And then from then on, it was really quite easy because I wasn't taking the task. I was really just asking their opinion and then submitting. Um, at that time, there was no SB 562. At that time, there was just the bigger idea of single payer and the uh, HR 676 out of DC. Um, but when SB 562 came down, it got a whole lot easier. So don't be afraid to approach your leaders. Speak from the heart. Tell them of a personal experience. And when you hang up that phone the first time and said, oh, that did not go so well, then you know how to do it better the next time. And the second time is easier. And then by the time you get up to about the 300th time, you're very, very, very good at it. And can you give us a little rundown of where the California Medical Association stands and then who is behind and who is for this bill on the larger associations? Well, the doctor doesn't want to take that much. <laughs> so, I I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure I would be surprised that their doctors can be a little, um, yes. a little slow to get on the bus. <laughs> in my experience, in my community, there's a handful of us who actively are in the single payer um, movement. But I think that's changing, though. This new generation. Um, mm -hmm. of doctors, oh, especially. Yeah, yeah. and. Mm -hmm. and so we met with we met with the medical association, and that's what they said. They said really, the med students and this new younger generation of docs really likes Medicare for all. Um, the um, what's interesting is that the medical association um, did express uh, opposition to SB five six two, but they did it in the context of um, support if amended, right, or oppose unless amended was actually the, the framework, right. But the same thing, right. That's much softer than they've ever been before. They have seven principles for reform. We've met six of them by their own admission. And we can meet the seventh, too. They just haven't really told us about it until the hearing. But we can do it. Uh, and so the truth is, really, doctors are not going to get a better deal than this. Oh, I, right? they, I, I mean, agree. Exactly. I mean, so this is the reality. All of, again, remember, we were talking about physician shortages and so forth. The present system has no answer. This does. Improving the practice environment, ensuring swift, timely reimbursement, raising the Medi-Cal rates, all those things are really good. Putting clinical judgment as primary, not letting technology override it, making a single standard of safe therapeutic care, this is really a clinician's reform. It is not typical of many other proposals for Medicare for All. It is much more driven by nurses and doctors. And so we actually think that the case is profoundly powerful in favor of SB 562 for doctors. And we're going to continue to press that. And we, we do expect doctors to end up on, on our side. Well, I think simplicity alone would be one of the, um, what I foresee that my colleagues appreciating is just the um, kind of cleaning it up and keeping it simple. And I have um, migrated from uh, primary care into working in the area of hospice and palliative care. And, and one of the experiences that has been so um, very difficult and is a really a moral outrage is I would see people who waited until they could get on Medicare. They would wait 
to have a test, to have a study, to have something done. And they might have waited months to find out that it's too late. They were diagnosed with something terminal that might have been addressed had they had Medicare earlier or had access earlier. And it, it's just, it's just, it's inexcusable. And that is, that is actually not uncommon. We, nurse, Kathy, we have nurses who tell us we've got people being rolled into the ER, you know, uh, in the midst of a heart attack who are saying, I'm not 65, I can't mm -hmm. do it. We have to do they wait. Exactly. What, and Kathy, you had to help. You had someone who collapsed. Yes. You're in Roseville, right? Yes. Well, I think I said this. So, so said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he yeah. was really worried about having to pay for that ambulance ride, which was going to be $2,000. He refused the ambulance. He refused the ambulance. Yeah. Yes, he did. He was, and, and, and he didn't want us to call 911, but we said, no way. We did. We did. But then later, he, he never went to the hospital until finally we convinced him, found out that he was a veteran, and said, well, what are you waiting for? So his friend took him to Mather, um, uh, the VA there, and found out later that he's doing well. But he worried about an ambulance ride. He worried about paying those bills. And he said, you know what? Forget about it. You know, if we have to get a GoFundMe account, you know, forget about it. Right, a GoFundMe account for a veteran to get health care. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Ridiculous. So at a, at a rally to fight for health care rights, someone falls over and and then doesn't want the ambulance called because they can't afford it. It was it was it was it was yeah. the waiting costs more. Yeah. Do you have Do you have any ideas what the new federal health care laws might do to SB 562, especially in? the cuts to Medicaid or the waiver that may be required for California to do this type of system? But yeah, just, you want to go to the point. Oh, I just go to my usual line. The more nonsense that comes out of DC, the more ch the better the chance for 562. <laughs> <laughs> The, if something happens in Washington, uh, if, if the Senate figures out a way to pass some, something similar to the House and they both end up passing something and send it on to the, to the President, um, we would, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we would um, be in a position in California to respond because those changes will take effect in 2020 under the House bill. And we, if we can move quickly, we can have a new system up and running by then. So this is the best response to all the shenanigans in Washington. Regarding the doctors, ask your doctor. What does your doctor think about SB 562? And have them go talk to the CMA. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for your participation in this healthcare forum tonight. And we want to bring Mindy back to <clears throat> Thank you, Pam, for doing such a great job. And thanks to our panel and speaker. And um, are we on, Paul? Yes. OK. And we're waiting for our film. Is that not going to be playing? OK. We're, we're waiting for the Lily Claims Tom Department, Ernestine. No, not cut. Claims Department, Ernestine Tomlin. No, Claims Department, Ernestine Tomlin. We consider that an elective no, procedure. No, we meaning we consider that an elective procedure. Claims Department, Ernestine. <laughs> Not Claims Department, Ernestine Tomlin. No, not covered. We consider that an elective procedure, meaning we elect not to pay for it. <laughs> well, it's not our fault you've had two heart attacks. You should have stopped at one. Of course you have your choice of doctor. Do you want the doctor to give you or not? It's your choice. You must think HMO stands for help me out. <laughs> Remember, your health is our business, not our concern. Oh, now it is. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I, I would like to wrap up this evening with a quote, great quote from Joan Baez. Action is the antidote to despair. 
With all the despair over the uncertainty of our healthcare system's future, we believe that now is the time to take action. So I ask you, are you ready? Or would you rather have to deal with Ernestine? <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and I hope you got a lot out of this.